everyone! In this video, I'm going to be covering some nano manufacturing basics as well as giving you an introduction to some patterning processes. Nano manufacturing approaches can generally be classified into two different categories top down or bottom up. In a top down approach, we're going from large to small, whereas in a bottom up approach, we're going from simple to complex. So, what this means is that in a top down approach, we're starting off with our bulk materials and then modifying the structure until we get our desired product. Subflash infralithography is an example of a top-down approach, and I'll go out, I'll, I'll give more detail on what each of these steps mean later in this video. In a bottom-up approach, we're starting up from our molecules and building up these nanostructures brick by brick. So in this example schematic I've shown, we start off with our bulk wafer and then alter the area of the wafer um, using some chemical treatment. We then grow or assemble um, or grow or assemble our desired structure. So I like to relate uh, I like to relate top-down or bottom-up approaches to building a house. In a top-down approach, um, building a house would be like building a house out of a big block of cement and then hacking away at it to get our doors and our windows. In a bottom-up approach, we would build our house up brick by brick. As you can imagine, there are a lot of advantages to bottom-up approach. Um, we have less uh, wasted materials, and because we're building up our building up our structure molecule by molecule, we can have much smaller feature sizes and especially tailored chemical functionalities. But actually, top-down approaches are what are currently used in industry, and they've been very successful um, due to uh, a lot of outstanding innovations that have happened within these within uh, the semiconductor space. These innovations can be described by Moore's law. So Gordon Moore was uh, a, is and is a, is is and was a very central figure um, in the semiconductor industry. Uh, he, in addition to co-founding Intel with Bob Noyce, he published a paper where he made Moore's law. So Moore's law is this idea that the number of transistors that can fit on a single microprocessor will double every single year, every two years. And the companies that have held true to this trend have been very successful. So we've all heard of Texas Instruments, Intel, Samsung, whereas the companies that have not been able to double the number of transistors that can fit on a computer chip every two years have not fared as well. Um, it's important for us to be able to fit more transistors on a computer chip because this is directly related to performance. The more transistors we can fit on a computer chip, um, the faster we can get our device to perform. Um, and not only that, um, the cheaper we can make our devices and the smaller. This is an example of, a of an NMOS transistor. And I, I'm, we're showing this here so that you can see how complex these devices are and it, also how small. So this is an SEM image and the different colors of the materials show, the different colors show different materials. And you can also see here from this length scale that it's very small. So now we're moving on to patterning processes. Um, photolithography is one example of a patterning process used in industry, and I'm going to take you through the steps here. So in the first step of photolithography, we deposit our photoresist. So we do this using a spin coder. We have our wafer mounted to a plate, and then we deposit our uh, photoresist. The spinning motion of the plate causes the photoresist to spread evenly across the wafer, and we can actually adjust the speed and acceleration of the spin coder until we get our desired thickness of photoresist. The next step is exposure. So here we have our Batman mask, and we shine a light through this Batman mask, and wherever the light hits, um, it reacts with the wafer. So here you can see that with this lens, we're able to focus the light and we can pattern multiple areas. The final step of photolithography is etch. So in the etch step, the photoresist blocks any etch step so that the etch only touches, only hits the areas of the substrate that are not covered by resist. And you can see that here. So photoresists seem really cool. So how do they work? Well, there are two different types of photoresists, ones that use uh, dissolution inhibitors and ones that are called chemically amplified photoresists. So this, the dis ones with dissolution inhibitors are from the pre-1980s. And essentially, the light reacts, where the light 
um, touches the touches the polymer, it reacts and then gets rid of these dissolution inhibitors such that um, the photoresist now becomes soluble in the developer solution. And this is the chemical reaction. So light is hitting the polymer matrix and then these areas are becoming soluble. Post 1980s, um, actually one of the professors in our department, Dr. Grant Wilson, along with two of his colleagues, pioneered a, what is called a chemically amplified photoresist. And these resists are so cool because basically they only have to react once and then, uh, and then they initiate a series of reactions. So here you can see a light's hitting the surface. Um, and because it's chemically amplified, uh, only one reaction needs to take place. And then we get rid of these dissolution inhibitors and we have patterning. Um, so as you can see from this process, using a chem chemically amplified photoresist is much faster. Uh, using the resists that only have uh, the dissolution um, that only have the dissolution inhibitors and no photo acid generators, um, the amount that's reacted is directly proportional to the light and the amount that it gets exposed. So this is much faster and pretty awesome than what's currently used today. And because of that, these guys have made lots of money. So Moore's Law cannot continue forever. And actually, many have predicted um, that it will end pretty soon. And Intel, I think, just announced last year that they've essentially reached their limits with Moore's Law. So what this means is that people are no longer think that we can achieve this goal of, two trans uh, of doubling of transistors every two years. There are alternatives um, to lithography techniques. However, these methods are very costly and would require time to implement. So um, bottom-up approaches, while having showing a lot of promise, are very underdeveloped. So another alternative to um, typical lithography processes is actually a technique that was pioneered by Dr. S. V. Srinivasan and Dr. Grant Wilson. And this technique is called step flash imprint lithography. In step flash imprint lithography, you're not using light to pattern your surface, but you're instead using a pattern template, which is shown here. So what you're doing with this template is you first coat your wafer with a transfer layer. You then place the template near the wafer, but not touching it and you dispense a liquid etch barrier. So basically, um, a liquid etch barrier is something that will resist the etch. You then bring your template and wafer um, in contact with your transfer layer and expose it with UV. And what this does is it causes, the, um, it, it causes a reaction to take place such that your etch barrier only has uh, your desired pattern. You can then oxygen etch through this etch barrier and so again, because this is resisting etch, the pattern is only transferred in areas where the etch barrier is not. And then you strip the etch barrier. So all that you're left with is your desired pattern. So again, the primary difference between step and flash imprint lithography and a technique like photolithography is that in step and flash imprint lithography, you're not using light to pattern your substrate. So the limitation behind photolithography and the reason why we cannot achieve uh, even finer resolution or smaller feature sizes is because we've hit the limits of light. So uh, the minimum feature size is defined by the wavelength of light that you're using. And so an alternative to um, photolithography is called extreme ultraviolet lithography, where instead of using um, where we use ultraviolet light to pattern the surface and the ultraviolet light has an extremely small wavelength which allows us to achieve even smaller feature sizes. So EUV um, has a lot, again a lot of promise because we can achieve these very small dimensions however it's very expensive and cost and requires m like very expensive light sources and not only that these light sources heat up which can make the process control very difficult um, and very hard to manage and control. So thank you so much. That's all we have for patterning. So as a review, we covered photolithography, step flash infrared lithography, and extreme ultraviolet lithography, um, which 
as um, incidentally are all examples of top-down approaches. So review the lectures and be ready for your quiz tomorrow. Thank you.